So the craziest thing happened yesterday, and I'm still a bit flabbergasted. I'm still a bit at a loss for words to speak about it. But literally, my favorite singer made a speech just for me. And you guys might be thinking I'm crazy, and I know it sounds crazy, but I promise that by the end of this, you will understand what I mean. And you will think that, yeah, she did make this speech just for me. But first, please subscribe on YouTube. If you are listening on Spotify, please also subscribe. Send it to your friends before we start. But anyways, you know, I have been at a crossroads in my life lately and I got sick a couple of weeks ago and I spent the better part of two weeks sick. So I was rethinking about a bunch of stuff in my life, like I said in a previous video. And when I'm sick, when I'm in these situations, or when I'm not feeling that well, when something's happening in my life or in my head, I try to, or I tend to gravitate to some artists, some musicians especially, that make me feel good or that help me go through that path, go through those days. Some musicians that I used to listen to a lot when I was younger, and the main one that I do listen to on in these situations is Lana Del Rey. And I really love Lana. And I know that many people think that she's all about summertime sadness or that she's all about the sad girl vibes. And to a point, she is. But to me, Lana is like a comfort artist, you know, like we have comfort food. And sometimes when you're kind of sick, you want to eat some things that remind you of your childhood. And to me, she is that kind of artist in which when you're not that well, when you're not feeling that good, you just listen to them and something deep inside of you resonates with them and you somehow feel better and you're able to get over that hump. So I've been listening to her a lot lately and one thing that I've been listening to, like binge listening to it and I kind of just can't get enough of it is the Ride music video of her. And of course, I'll, I'll, to I'll talk about how she did the speech for me in a second we'll we'll get there i'm just painting the picture before so you guys understand the synchronicities that happen and that are happening and why i believe truly believe that she did that speech just for me okay but anyways as i was saying so i'm outlining a book as well and i'm thinking a lot about the past and about things that happened in my life. And among these things, you end up thinking about the times in which things weren't that good or in which your mindset about something wasn't that good. So you ended up suffering perhaps more than you should have. And I, I've been thinking about these things and to a certain point, I might have gotten sick because of this as well, because I was going back to some dark moments in my life and trying to figure out what happened and why those things happened and what were the lessons that I learned eventually. But I also am thinking a lot about good things in my life. And one thing that started popping up in my mind lately was the theme of New York, of going back to New York. It's been over a decade since I've last been to New York. And New York's a place that's very um, emblematic in my life that I've been to a few times already. And I've been to with most of the people that I most love in my life. First with my dad when I was 10 and then with my 
parents and my sister when I was 12, and then with my dad and my uncles, and then with my dad and my cousins. So I've been there a few times, and it's always very emblematic, especially the first one was a trip that completely changed my life and my relationship to my dad. And, well, she is from New York, and she was raised in Lake Placid. That's about six hours north of New York. It's cold as fuck as she herself described on the speech she did yesterday. But anyways, she she gets, she was awarded as... And she got the Songwriter Icon Award at N MPA yesterday. So NMPA is the National Music Publishers Association. And she was awarded for being an awesome songwriter, which she absolutely is. And she was awarded at Lincoln Center. And it's funny because the first time I went to New York, second time as well actually i stayed at a ymca with my dad that's like four or five blocks from lincoln center and it's funny how these synchronicities happen but this is very superficial so far like the real synchronicities are still coming man so she starts her speech and of course, she she thanks the people that are there. She talks about how she was feeling like she was on like a 50s ballroom or something because someone, some people were playing like the jazz music before she was awarded. And, you know, she has that very um, Americana 1950s, 60s vibe um, aesthetic as well. And. I think she's embracing it again lately, like in her Coachella and and other of her late latest shows. She's she's kind of embracing like going back in time to that time when like the Born to Die era, the Paradise era, more of those um, 1950s, 60s aesthetic things. But anyways, she starts saying on her speech. So um, thank you for reminding me that there are people who say things I understand, who I can resonate with. And then she goes on talking about how when she was a kid, she would imagine how adults would treat kids in the future and how she wanted to be as an adult. And then she talks about her early, early life and getting into music. And when she was in college, how she actually started studying economics. But then, and this is where the synchronicities really start getting traction. So before we go, before we dive, dive in, lately I've been listening to her a lot after spending about a year without barely listening to her. Yesterday or the day before, uh, you know, those memories on your cell phone that pop up. So it, it showed me a picture of me with my cousin because we went to her a festival in which she, she played last year, like basically one year ago. And that photo popped up and I put it as an Instagram story. And I usually never put stories with old pictures, but I decided to, like I felt, I felt that I should. And I put something like iconic times and, and tagged him. And in that show, like he's a real motherfucker. He, he got to, he pretty much invaded the VIP area and like at the end of the show and, and he saw her backstage and he recorded a, a short video of her, like, like a selfie video kind of thing with her. Like he was able to see my favorite singer, like face to face, which was pretty cool. And she was also staying at the Copacabana Palace. That's like the, su the super famous hotel in which every 
great artist that comes to Rio, they stay at that place. And we were staying at like two blocks away from her, which was also so close. But anyways, this happened. And also a couple of days ago, I bought a book and you'll see why this is meaningful now. Because of course I buy a bunch of books, I read a bunch of books, I talk about a bunch of books, but this is a very specific book that I've been thinking about buying for ages because I see a lot of people mentioning it, but I had never come across to buying it until that, until literally a couple days ago. And her speech was yesterday. So back to the speech, she, she was saying that when she was in college, she started reading Think and Grow Rich. And one of the main things that Napoleon Hill says in this book is that you should burn all the bridges, that you should not have a plan B. You just have plan A and you have no plan B. Burn all bridges. You don't have, there's no way, no possibility that you won't do what you put in your mind that you're going to do. So <clears throat> your purpose, the vision that you have for your life, for what you want to do, you have that vision very defined, very clear vision of where you want to go, of what you want to do. And that's it. <clears throat> you don't have another option. Guess what? Guess which book I just bought and I've been reading and taking notes. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And he talks about the burning bridges thing right at the beginning of the book. And I've, it was one of the things that, that I highlighted and I'm trying to find where I did the highlight of this, but I'm not finding it right now. Anyways. Yes, that's not the important thing. The important thing is what she said and how when I listened to it and bear in mind that the comments on the video that I saw of her speech, they were saying things like, oh, yeah, she like she was just blabbering. She kind of didn't know what she was saying because she was improvising like she didn't really have a speech prepared. She kind of went off the cuff on a whim like inspired by what she had heard other people talking about that night. But anyways, she was, she talked about this, about not having a plan B about burning the bridges and how she ended up changing her major at in college because she was doing economics to have a plan B. So if she didn't make it as a singer, she could just get a job. So she changed her major to philosophy to be more in touch with the deeper philosophies to, you know, to have, to do something that had more to do with becoming an artist than studying business or economics. And, and then she goes on to say that the only friends I had were in the books that I read, which is both very deep and a bit sad in a way, but at the same time, that resonates so much with me that because I've always had friends in book in the form of books and and having the offers speaking to me, and I'm sure that many of you also, because you you are a bunch of nerds as well had that feeling of, you know, reading a book and feeling seen and understanding that there is more to life than what we see in our day to day. And, you know, the great thing about this book is that it tells you that you need to have a very clear vision of where you want to go and where, what you want to do with your life.
And that's something that she says in some interviews and in the ride monologue that she had a vision for her life and that her vision was to make her life a work of art. And that's so poetic. That's so beautiful. Like, think about it. To make your life a work of art. It's crazy. And then she also said that she read Esther Hicks, like, ask and you shall be given. And lately, you know, I used to be the kind of person that was very anti um, that anything that you could call woo-woo about, you know, law of attraction or all of that thing. I, I, I always thought that those things were bullshit. But in a way, they're very real. And books like these really help you understand how these things work and I'm going to do I'm going to do a book a video just about this book and probably a live and how I think that this is actually the American Bible so this is one of single-handedly one of the reasons the that the United States are the country that they are but that's for another day back to the the speech so she talks about having an invisible council because you know when you're starting out you can't you don't have access to that council to that um, boardroom of directors to help you because you're just starting out you're just like you have this vision and by definition, your vision should be something outrageous, something that seems impossible because if you don't have that vision that's very deeply connected that you can resonate with, that truly resonate with, and that gives you that burning desire to fulfill it, you won't have enough motivation to go through. So you need to reach for the stars. And even if you don't get to the stars, you'll get to the moon, that kind of thing that Pitbull says on one of his songs as well. And that's the thing, the having the vision of making your life a work of art or whatever it might be in your case, you need to define, the only person that can define the vision is yourself. And I think it's a moral predicament that everyone should do this of, having a well-defined purpose and not just derping around and going through life like you're going to live forever and not doing anything that you think you should be doing, like, or actually just doing the things you think you should be doing and not doing the things you sh actually should be doing, not the things that people told you that you should be doing, but the things that for you make sense and that really resonate with you because as long as we know we have only one life and we need to make the best of it. So she talks about the invisible council and how that took her a lot of imagination and how nowadays, of course, she has the best lawyers, the best um, agents, the best everything. She has access to that. But when she was starting out from the age of 18 until she was 26, that's when she started getting traction and becoming a more well-known. So it took her eight years from when she started envisioning this, from when she read the book and started envisioning it until she got to a point in which she started getting some success. So you can see that sometimes it may take a while, but you need to give yourself the chance to get there. You need to give yourself the chance of having that vision, of having that burning desire, and of day after day doing those small things that will get there eventually. And then she says, I didn't have, well, before we go here, 
So she says that she needed a lot of imagination because, of course, to have that invisible counsel, you need to truly imagine talking to them, like thinking, like, for instance, think about something that you really want in your life, but you don't have anyone to talk to about it. So think maybe um, if I could talk to my 80 year old self, what would he tell me? Like, what would he change in his life? Or think about, try to think about the most intelligent person in a certain area that you could possibly talk to. And maybe it's a writer, maybe it's Jesus Christ or Buddha or Gandhi or whatever it is in whatever aspect of life that you want to get better at or that you want counsel think about what they would say and this takes a lot of imagination a lot of thinking power and then again that's why this book is called think and grow rich because it's about being able to focus your imagination being able to visualize things and turning that vision into a reality. So then she goes on to say, I didn't have to fake it till I made it. I had to feel it. And that's another thing. Like, of course, you might say, oh, yeah, you listen to her a lot. So you kind of will get some of her thoughts. But that's not something that's in her music as far as I know of but that's something that I constantly talk about and I constantly write about about faking till you make it or about believing until you achieve something or about acting as if you already are <clears throat> sorry uh, acting as if you already are the person you want to become <clears throat> or thinking about the person you need to become to be able to do the things that you want to do with your life. And, and she said it and like literally listening to this speech of hers, like the first time I listened to it, it gave me a chill in my spine because she was saying so many things that resonated with me and that resonate with the things that I've done and that I'm doing and that I intend on doing. And it was crazy. Then she, she says, the further you go along a path, the path gets more narrow. It's up to you to widen the path. So the further you go along, so when you, you say, I'm going to do something, I'm going through this path. I, I want to become a rock star. I want to become a business person. I want to become a good leader. I want to become whatever it is. As, as you go through the path, so you see, it's kind of like a pyramid of sorts. When you're at the base, there are infinite possibilities. But as you go through the path, it starts getting more narrow and narrow and narrower. So you've made it the choices over here and now you kind of have less choices in a way because also in a way you have something to lose at the beginning you have nothing to lose so when you're 18 20 22 you don't have much to lose but as time goes by and you make choices and things happen in your life you have less options unless you make it a point to widen that road so that that path can be wider and that you can have different options. And I think that's inspiring in a way. And it's interesting to see that in each and every record of hers, she, she's not afraid of completely changing the sound of completely changing even the style, the genre, the genre of her songs. Like supposedly she's going to put out a, a country record this year. So let's see if it happens. But anyways, 
before we go further, another thing that I just remembered that I was thinking about is that I was thinking about writing about her specifically in the next few days. And I, I thought about it last week, I think, or last weekend. And it was about how sometimes we, we think that we need to be a certain way if we want to achieve success in any endeavor. We kind of think we need to be or have an aesthetic or, or you know, there, you know, when, like, when you think, I, I want to be a good businessman, I want to be a good musician, I want to be a good whatever, a, an actor, or, you know, whatever you truly ever really wanted to be a dancer, whatever it is, you have the vision, you have that, that image in your mind of how, it, how you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to act. In the case of an, a musical artist, how you're supposed to sound, perhaps. But with Lana, she, from pretty much from the very beginning, she kind of seems like she never really gave a fuck that she didn't do things to become the greatest or most famous artist that she could be. Greatest in the sense of like having a big following, having like this, those huge shows, the biggest possible shows kind of thing. And when you look at her career, like in many ways, she was more concerned about putting out the most authentic and the most, like the, the music that perhaps she thought would like be most artistic to her or that she would have more fun writing or that she would have like, that would resonate more with her than properly thinking, wow, what should I put out so that I can put it on the radio or nowadays with social media, like I need to do a two minute song that can have those, you know, those, those snippets that people can put on TikTok or whatever. She doesn't care about that. She cares about putting out the best music possible about being authentic, about telling a story. And I think that's what makes people love her. And that's why so many people love her and so many people resonate with her very deeply. You know, at the show that I went to, there were many people that truly, of course, they say this half jokingly, but they were like calling her mama or mommy or mother like if she was her mom because some of her songs really give you that vibe of like she's telling you a very dark story about her life or not necessarily her life but of someone like the the character in the story goes through, through a deep dark thing and many people resonate because they understand what it is to go through something similar. And she's, e she's even been called out on that for songs like Ultra Violence for supposedly glorifying domestic abuse. But I, I don't think that's like her intention at all of glorifying anything. But it's about speaking to people who have been through those kinds of situations and who have lived through those dark times and, and saying, you know, I've, I've been through something similar. I've been there. I know what it is. I know how it is. And, and, you know, kind of like hugging that person, like everything's going to be okay. Okay. So I also had terrible boyfriends. I also had, a time in my life in which people didn't believe in me and and I was sort of alone, just me and my books and my uh, virtual council or invisible council. But I went through all of that and I became a 
fucking great artist that's influenced a whole generation of new artists as well. And, and now I'm finally, um, I think she, in a way she finally accepted some things about her life and about herself. And I, I can see that she's much more confident now going up on stage. And there were times in the beginning of her career that she would seem a bit uneasy on stage, like kind of not knowing because she's a natural introvert. And I think that's also one of the things that makes us love her as well as introverts and, and resonating with, with the feelings she shows. And you can see in some of her concerts, like some of the faces she does, you know, the, the expressions she does when in the middle of a song or you can resonate a lot as an introvert because you, you kind of know what she's feeling. And I think that's another thing about being an introvert that people perhaps don't understand, especially extroverts, that we feel very deeply and we can resonate with people very deeply. And Lana definitely is a person that is a very deep feeler. And you can, you can see it in her lyrics and her songs and everything that she puts out. And also in the way she interacts with her fans. Like she gives this preschool teacher kind of vibe, like very sweet and very loving. And... Of course, with fans that <laughs> that she sees that are actual fans that that treat her well, like not with assholes. Like no one deserves to be to, like she doesn't need to treat the assholes well. But I think even them, she does treat well sometimes. Anyways, going back, I so I, I was thinking about think and grow rich and how many references to the book she actually makes in her music. And so for instance, she has a song that's called burning desire. And that's one of the things that he talks about time and time again, about having a burning desire towards your vision of your vision being so great and resonating so deeply with you that you have a burning desire that you'll wake up every day thinking about it. You'll, you won't rest until you have your vision accomplished. And another thing that this book talks a lot about is about having faith. And Faith in a deeper sense, not only just like in a shallow, oh, you should pray kind of sense, but true faith. True faith, not only in God or in the infinity or the universe, but also perhaps more importantly, faith in yourself. Faith that you can accomplish whatever you set out to accomplish that you can do the things that you want to do, faith that you can become the person you want to become. And she talks about faith in a couple of songs, but I think one title of a song that really resonates with this idea is hope is a dangerous thing for a woman to, like me to have. Her song, Hope. And I'm not sure why it's dangerous, like, because she has this very deep personality sometimes, and and I'm not sure which of her facets she thinks it's dangerous to have hope. But looking at her life and her career, I can understand that she must have had many times in which 
she needed to have the faith and to have faith in a way i think you have to have hope you need to hope for things to get better you need to have that deep rooted feeling that things can get better and that they will get better and that goes back to to what she said like i didn't have to fake it till i make it to admit it i had but i had to feel it so she if you can feel truly feel as if you already are the person that can accomplish your vision it will make it so much easier and it's all about visualizing about seeing those things and i want to end this talking a bit more about the ride monologue and i'm thinking of reading it out for you guys or perhaps showing it on the screen even because i've i've been listening to this on repeat lately and and it's so beautiful like really ride is a song that i love and that i've loved for years now and it's a song that i always play when i'm doing things alone so when i'm traveling alone or you know when you're in those moments in which you kind of you can't really count on anyone else but yourself and there are many moments like these in life moments in which the people that live near you like family your friends they might not understand what you're going through or they might not understand why certain things are important to you and in these moments you'll need to go at it alone you'll need to count on your faith on your invisible counsel on god on you know things that not the people that are near you you'll need to pretty much you're alone at it so on this monologue that's absolutely beautiful and that i now realize that completely speaks to what she was saying about this book and about defining her vision and about having that burning desire for the vision and like i said before she says that she had a vision for her life and it was to make her life full work of art and i think she she's accomplished that already but i hope she goes on for another 60 years making music and being awesome but the monologue is starts like this i was in the winter of my life and the man that i met along the road were my only summer at night i fell asleep i fell asleep with visions of myself dancing and laughing and crying with them so i think in this point of falling asleep with visions of herself and dancing and laughing and crying with that it goes back to that invisible counsel thing and about visualizing herself as a true artist as a, a an accomplished musician that at the time she wasn't she was starting out but being able to see herself as if she was already there and doing this every day every night like kind of thinking about it until she went until she fell asleep 3 years down the line of being on an endless world tour and my memories of them were the only things that sustained me and my only real happy times so now she talks about what she was envisioning of being on an endless world tour and those memories that were actually memories that she had created she was visualizing were the only things that sustained her and her only real happy times so she was 
sustaining herself in the present with memories that she was creating of a future that wasn't true still, but in her mind, she was making them true. She was envisioning it so that it would become true. So she was acting as if it was already true. She was seeing it as if it was already true. I was a singer, not a very popular one, who had home, once had dreams of becoming a beautiful poet. But upon an unfortunate series of events, saw those dreams dashed and divided like a million stars in the night sky that I wished on over and over again, sparkling and broken. So now she's talking about the reality at the time. So that she was a singer, she was starting out, but she was not very known, not very popular. But she has the, had those dreams of becoming that beautiful poet. And, and those dreams were time and time again, something happened. And those dreams didn't realize, they weren't realized, and, and they were divided like a million stars in the night sky. But at the same time, every time that something happened, she would still think about her vision again and dream and dream and dream and continue visualizing that she had accomplished the things that she wanted to accomplish. But I didn't really mind because I knew that it takes getting everything you ever wanted and then losing it to know what true freedom is. Deep. It takes every, getting everything you ever wanted and then losing it to know what true freedom is. So only when you relieve yourself of the need of having something can you be free and then you will attract the thing so things are easier when you don't feel a need you might want them but you don't need them and that's something that most people don't realize when the people I used to know found out what I had been doing, how I had been living, they asked me why. There's no use in talking to people who have a home. They have no idea what it's like to seek safety in other people. For home to be wherever you lie your head. So now she talks about meeting the people that she used to know, maybe her her family, maybe her friends from school, and they not understanding, like, why the hell are you putting yourself through this? Like, you don't need this. You can come back to your regular life. But then again, she had that vision, the frightening vision, <clears throat> that she was going to become something <clears throat> very specific. She was going to accomplish very specific goals. And she was not ready to forego that vision to go back. And that, of course, that wasn't without suffering. She was, she went through a bunch of things. She suffered a lot because you're always in that turmoil. Should I go back? Should I not go back? Should I continue on? Should I not continue on? Should I give up? Shouldn't I give up? But if, if I give up, will I be a loser? If I don't give up, will I be a loser anyway? You have that, those things, those thoughts going on through your mind, which will be given a very funny, not funny, a very, a metaphor that I really like will come soon enough. Then she goes on. I was an unusual girl. My mother told me I had a chameleon soul. No, more com no moral compass pointing to north. No fixed personality. Just an inner indecisiveness. That it was as wide and as unwavering as, wavering as the ocean. And if, I said, if, and if I said that I didn't plan for it to turn out this 
the way it did, I'd be lying. Because I was born to be the other woman. Who belonged to no one. Who belonged to everyone. Who had nothing. Who wanted everything. Who for fire for every experience. An obsession for freedom. That terrified me to the point I couldn't even talk about. So she always had that willingness, that obsession to be truly free, to do things that society at large and the people close to her wouldn't understand. And pushed me to a nomadic point of madness that both dazzled and dizzied me. And that's where the epilogue finish, the prologue finishes before the, the actual song starts. And a, a thing that I, I forgot to mention is that yesterday, before her speech, I actually wrote a poem, and that poem is sort of inspired on this ride monologue, but talking about my own experiences with life and about some of my darkest times and realizing as a young kid that life's not um, eternal, that people die, that, that things happen and that we, were, we are all going to die and thinking, will anyone remember me when I die? Will, like, but is anyone actually remembered? Because if you think of it, most people that died a hundred years ago, like no one even remembers, not even their families remember them. And even the people that we talk about from thousands of years ago, they're very few and far between. And maybe you think that 5,000 years ago, in 5,000 years from now, will people talk about them still? Maybe not. Like realistically, there's a good chance that there will be no mankind but then. And thinking about those things made me nihilistic and thinking that things had no meaning. But eventually I understood that things have meaning, but the meaning that they have is the meaning that you ascribe to them. And that life is a gift and you only have the present moment. You only have now and if you want to accomplish anything or if you want to live life to the fullest you just need to live the best possible strain of nows and just do things and don't wait to be happy don't wait to do the things you say you actually want to do with your life. And that's the importance of having the vision of having that clear cut path, that purpose of knowing that you're here for a reason. And if you don't think so, and you don't have that purpose, you don't have that vision for your life, then you truly aren't here for a reason. You're here just derping around, just being an NPC. And I don't want you to do this. And this, my purpose is to sh shine the light so that you stop being a fucking NPC and you be more like Lana and less like whatever NPC you, you're trying to be. So the song goes on. So I've been out on that open road. You can be on full-time daddy white and gold. And then she goes on and talks about traveling and being on the road and hearing the birds on the summer breeze. I drive fast. I am alone in the night. Been trying hard not to get into trouble, but I, I've got a war in my mind. So now she goes back to that point in time in which she had all of those thoughts spinning around her head and thinking like, should I go back? Should I not go back? 
should I give up being a singer? Should I give up being a singer? And then you can resonate with this in your life because there are many points in life in which you have this war raging in your mind. And you have to be very careful to not turn this into a war against yourself because that's very hurtful. And that's something that will lead to depression, will lead to dark times. And many times it's pretty much worthless to like get into a war with yourself. You know, so she talks about just writing, just writing. Don't leave me now. Don't say goodbye. Don't turn around. Leave me high and dry. And at the end, she says, I'm tired of feeling like I'm fucking crazy. I'm tired of driving till I see stars in my eyes. Look up to hear myself saying. Um, yeah, I always miss the point when I'm reading the lyrics. Baby, too much. To Dude, I think this is wrong. I think, <laughs> okay. I just ride. Too much I strive, I just ride. Yeah, I can resonate with that. So the song ends with her riding on sunset, towards the sunset. And then comes the epilogue of the monologue. Every night I used to pray that I'd find my people. And finally it did on the open road. So another thing, she still had the faith. And one of the things she was praying was to find her people. Like people that she could truly resonate with. Which she also talked about on the speech. Like remember she starts it out with, thank you for, thank you for reminding me that there are people who say things I understand. Like can resonate with. Then she goes on. We had nothing to lose, nothing to gain, nothing we desired anymore, except, except to make our lives a work of art. So she goes back to her vision. Live fast, die young, be wild and have fun. That's the thing it resonated a lot with. You know, live fast, die young, James Dean. I'm glad I'm over this now because I, I truly used to think that I would die before I was 27 and now I'm over 27 so I don't intend on dying and I actually feel like I'm much younger than I thought I would be and feel by the age I'm at now. So yeah, I don't intend on on going anywhere anytime soon. So that's one of the reasons we got to take care of ourselves, right? Of our bodies, of our minds, so that we can live to 100, happy, and energized. Then she goes on, I believe in the country America used to be. Yeah, that's, that's hard. That's hard for you Americans. Yeah, the country America used to be, the American dream. I believe in the person I want to become. Back to the vision. You need to have faith on yourself and on you, who you want to become. I believe in the freedom of the open road. And my motto is the same as ever. So she had a motto. I believe in the kindness of strangers. And, I'm, and when I'm at war with myself, I ride. I just ride. So when you are at war with yourself, you need to have something that you can do so that you forget about that war and you make amends with yourself. Because, again, you are the most important person in your own life. So you need to make amends with yourself so that you don't have to go through a war and you don't have to hurt yourself. Like, there are many things that might hurt you in the world and you don't have to be another one of them. And she finally finishes this with, who are you? Are you in touch with your darkest fantasies? Have you created a life for yourself where you're free to experience them? I have. 
I am fucking crazy, but I am free. So check out the death of this. Who are you? Are you in touch with your deepest fantasies, your darkest fantasies? Do you allow yourself to get in touch with those things that you actually want? The things that you truly want, not the things that someone told you you should want, not the things that you heard someone say were the best, were, were optimal, but the things that truly make sense to you, you and you only. Because when you're in your deathbed, most of the people that told you those things won't be there. Only a handful of people will be there. And what will you think about on your deathbed? Will you think of all of the people that you tried to please, but simply couldn't, that you were never good enough for them? Or will you think of the things that you did, the, the risks you took, the vision you had for your life, and that you actually accomplished it because you were brave enough to ride, even if that meant sometimes you had to ride alone, even if that meant sometimes you had to imagine, to have faith, or will you be on your deathbed and think about all of the things that you wish you had done, but you never had the guts to do them. That's a very important realization that you have to do, you have to have in your life. And if you don't think about this constantly, you will live a life that you will regret. For sure. You need to think where you want to go, what you want to accomplish with your life. Because if you don't, you will regret how you finish. You will regret the end of your life. So as we get to the end of this, I hope that you guys understand why I believe that my favorite singer wrote this speech, or better yet, made the speech because she did it improvising for me and why I feel this way and all of the synchronicities and all of the things lately that make me feel like I'm connected to her. And if by any chance you are listening to it, Lana, or if one of your friends or your staff is listening to it and you can forward this to her, I'd really love to have you on my podcast sometime. And I really love to jam, have a jam session with you, like play with you sometime. That would be fucking awesome. And it's one of the things in my vision, not only with you, but with other people that I admire. You guys are on my list. I will have you on my podcast. I will become friends with some of you guys. And we'll have a lot of fun and do some crazy shit. Because that's my vision. That's my burning desire to make the world a better place in my own way. And my own way is to help people shatter their limiting beliefs and do things that they thought were impossible for them. Because, oh, this is not for me. This is not the way I grew up. This is, you know oh, our family can't do that, or I'm too short, or I'm too shy, I'm too whatever. You're not anything. Like, literally. Dude, I went to the gym this morning, and, like, really, there was a guy on a wheelchair, and he was at the gym at 7 a.m., crushing it. Like, we don't have any excuses to not believe in ourselves, man. If that guy can crush it at the gym, 
despite being on a wheelchair, you can crush it as well in whatever you're giving yourself the limiting belief, you're giving yourself the crutches. Dude, feel inspired already. Go do whatever the fuck you should be doing. And if you don't know what you should be doing, figure it out. Because guess what? This is the game matrix. I don't know what to do. Figure it out. I know what to do. Do it. It's as simple as that. If you don't know what to do, figure the fuck out and go do it. That's how I like to, to finish this. If you like this, please like, sub, uh, comment, subscribe. If you can't forward this to a friend or a family member that should listen to this, please, by all means, do this. I want to have 1.2 million people as rock stars by the end of 2024. So that's my goal for this year to have 1.2 million rock stars because this is my calling. This is my thing I'm here to do in this world to help unleash your inner rock star. And your inner rock star is that Tyler Durden character, that character, that the version of you that is a badass, that does the things that you always wanted to do, but you were afraid of doing them. No, you're not afraid anymore because you will unleash your inner rock star. So thank you for watching. Share it with your friends. Keep rocking, keep rolling, and hope to see you soon, Lana.